what's up everybody and welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explain, we're looking at the long-awaited prequel, Orphan First Kill. Set a few years before the first film, Lena, aka Esther's saga, continues as she first orchestrates a brilliant escape from a psychiatric facility before traveling to America by impersonating the missing daughter of a wealthy family. I gotta say, when I heard they were making not just a sequel, but a prequel to Orphan after a decade and still starring Isabel Furman, I was more than skeptical. And that's honestly the most impressive thing about the movie. They actually managed to pull it off. I think it's because they wisely avoided using CG de-aging or anything like that and employed more old school filmmaking tricks. Things like forced perspective and kid stand-ins for reverse shots. It works way better than I expected. And even though Isabel is now in her 20s, this aspect never took me out of the story. That was their biggest hurdle in my book and they pulled it off. Fortunately, the movie itself is an amusing and somewhat cheesy romp that any fan of the original will appreciate as well, with lots of foreshadowing and references to pick up on. I also must commend the big twist because it adds a lot more to the story and I did not see it coming. We technically already know how things end, but the twist really shakes things up and was very effective to keep the story interesting, even if we do know where things are headed. So let's check out Orphan First Kill, breaking down the story, including how it connects to the first film, as well as explaining the big twist and ending. Oh hey, good to know Dark Castle is still around. feel like we haven't heard from them since like 2009 either. Our story picks up a few years before Astro moves in with the Coleman family and learn just how she wound up there. Back in Estonia in 2007, a car makes its way down a long winding road flanked by snow everywhere. They keep driving and their destination seems really out in the middle of nowhere, driving deeper into the snowy oblivion. The lady Anna makes it to the Sarn Institute, which we remember mentioned in the first film. As she makes her way towards the building, Lena watches from the window above. She gets buzzed in and security gives her the once over, looking like they run a pretty tight ship around here. A doctor enters to greet her and we learn that it's her first day. To really emphasize the importance of safety, he hands over a binder with their security procedures, suggesting that she memorize them from front to back. Now, most of their patients are docile, but as for others, and right on cue, another orderly interrupts with urgent news. Lena isn't in a room, and no one can find her. Uh-oh. The danger is quite abundant, as they instantly put the whole facility into lockdown mode, and as the doc says, Lena is their most dangerous patient. In fact, the only reason they had an opening in the first place is because her predecessor broke protocol and it did not end well. He sticks her into a room and tells her to stay here until they find her. She'll be safe. They inadvertently have put her right in harm's way, hearing a pencil scratching, and she sees Lena scribbling away at a desk. Anna asks to see what she's working on and is impressed. It's a sketch of herself, chuckling that it's very good. She introduces herself and asks her name, and Lena stands up, holding her pencil tight. Lena, she smiles. She asks again if her parents work here or... And Lena is confused. Why do you think that? And she realizes now who she's talking to. I mean, she did just tell you her name and everything. The doc and others bust in, trying to get her to calm down. She lifts her hands in surrender and drops the pencil. The orderlies overtake her and she laughs as they strong arm her out of the room. And it does at least have the excuse of not knowing Lena has a childlike appearance. And the doctor reminds us of her whole deal that made up the big mystery of the first film. Here they just lay it all out there. She suffers from a gland disorder that causes proportional dwarfism, halting her growth at age 10. So she looks like a child, but is actually 31. When she first arrived, she struggled so hard against her restraints that she would bleed severely, a lesson he thinks on just how much she wants to be free. These restraints cause permanent scars that Lena covers with ribbons on her neck and wrists. Anna feels some sympathy for Lena, imagining what it must be like going through life with the whole world seeing you as a child. But the doctor warns, do not be fooled. She uses her affliction as much as she suffers from it. She's an exceptional con artist and establishes what becomes becomes a pattern for her. She previously wormed her way into a family, posing as a runaway. They took her in, and her normal MO was to steal whatever she could and disappear. This time, he trails off, but based on the blood-soaked evidence images he shows off, we can assume that Lena killed them all. And that's why she lives here now. So that was her first kill, technically. I guess. Lena idly paints along with another spaced out lady who fiddles with her paint like a child. It seems Lena has her kind of trained in a way. All she says is her name and the lady goes absolutely bonkers at the drop of a hat. She repeats her name again and she just as suddenly stops. Lena then rewards her with a piece of candy for doing her bidding. The security guy, Dimitri, is buried in a book and then looks to Lena's room where she's watching TV. Pretty sure that's Shirley Temple and the conversation about daddy takes on weird connotations when we think of her whole thing. 
falling in love with her fake dad, essentially. Dimitri visits her and first drops off an important package. She unwraps it, beaming that it's perfect, seeing that it's her trademark black prairie girl looking outfit. There's one problem. She can't tie the ribbons herself and holds out her hands for him to do it. He must have gotten her to the dress and now she wants to give him something in return. She squeaks that he can come in and he foolishly does so. And yeah, it seems like he has taken a liking to Lena, which is weird. At first I was like, wait, no, no, that's a kid. And then I'm like, no, wait, she's 31, right? So it's okay? less weird or maybe more weird not sure anyway she uses his feelings to her advantage and after hopping up on a chair starts to stroke his chest tenderly just as Shirley says daddy has to go away she appears to be going in for a kiss but instead bashes his head repeatedly on the wall until he's done for woo pretty brutal she retrieves a sack made from her straitjacket and Dimitri's security card allowing her to easily escape the cell she sneaks through the hall staying out of sight and slinks into an elevator on the next floor she's stopped by an armed guard he shouts for her to give up and she only laughs in response her buddy is there lena asking in a sing-song voice if she wants some candy she triggers her into another violent rage absolutely wrecking the guy that lady should be in restraints Jeez. and she tosses her another candy on the way out for a job well done anna buckles up and is shocked to see a bloody lena standing right in front of her she gives her a sinister shush and disappears the staff discuss things in the aftermath and this was all too much for anna this job isn't for her yeah probably good call Lady. So she drives all the way back to her place in the city, still looking shaken up. It seems that she might have brought along an unwelcome passenger. When just about to step inside, the back trunk beeps open. She cautiously returns to the door, seeing Lena's feet on the staircase. She swipes at her, ending her especially bad first day of work on an even more sour note. You know, she's dead. Lena looks around, the pretty swanky looking place, and sits down to play the piano, her bloody fingers staining the keys. We remember that she played the piano in the first one, but when did she learn how to play it is the question. Considering her next options, she searches for missing girls aged 9 to 11 online and finds one that could just work, Esther Albright. They do bear a striking similarity, and considering it's been a few years, she might be able to pass off as her. She scribbles her new name in a Bible and dons her signature outfit, officially claiming her new alias of Esther. Just about to leave, she notices Anna is still barely alive at the bottom of the stairs. She can't have that and gives her a few more deadly whacks with the business end of a pipe. She ain't messing around this time, huh? She then puts her plan into action, randomly showing up in the middle of the night on a swing set. Soon after, a police officer is there wanting to know where her parents are. They're in America, she cries, and tells him her new name of Esther Albright. All the way across the pond in Connecticut, we meet the Albright family. An intense fencing match is going down, and Gunner gets a point to his mother's delight. After his victory, his parents invite him to come out, but he's off to hang with his pals. Alan moans that it's supposed to be family night, but Trisha backs her boy. He works his butt off when he's not studying, he's fencing. Alan wanders off in thought, and she tries to snap him back to reality. We find out why he's so withdrawn. It's because he is still missing Esther. She tries to make it clear that she is not coming back and relates that she misses her every day too. Or perhaps they're in for a surprise as Detective Donan is there with some shocking news. They have an update on Esther. So Trisha jets to Moscow to retrieve her, and from what they can piece together about her story, she was abducted by someone and taken to Russia. She pretended that Esther was her daughter until one day she finally escaped. They do have a therapist in waiting, but the lady stresses that what she really needs right now is her family. She also tells them to be on the lookout for some potential changes. Four years is a long time in the development of a child. Trisha enters to her tinkling away at the piano and gives her a warm hello getting emotional. She asks to get a good look at her, and Lena tentatively comes out from behind the piano with her eyes down. Mom tells her that it's okay, and Lena runs into her arms, her new mommy telling her everything is right now that she's back. On the flight back, which by the way is on a PJ, looking like her new fam is loaded. Judging Lena. Trisha shows off pictures of the family, and Lena beams that she's excited to see them all. But Trisha reminds her that Mutt Mutt passed. It's just them now. Ah, good old Mutt Mutt. Still miss her. Lena is frustrated with herself at the slip up, and sneaks a bottle of vodka from the flight attendant. She holds up in the bathroom and gulps it down before having a full on tantrum over the mistake. Don't want to blow it. She calms down and returns to her seat, ready to get it right. After landing, she wonders if father will recognize her. And Trisha scoffs, not if she calls him that. And she corrects herself, uh, dad, right? See, learning more, you gotta fit in. Trisha gives her the once over, surprised by just how grown up she is. She looks like a little lady. Well, you got that right. She removes her hat and then tries to go for her neck ribbon. But Lena grabs her hand aggressively. Yeah, let's leave those alone for now. Strong grip there, kid, too. Jeez. She has an emotional reunion with her 
faux papa. I always knew you'd come back, he moans. Gunner is much less invested, only giving his sis a casual, hey, hmm wonder why that is. Even mom commands him to do better, and he can at least muster up the energy to give her a hug. They roll up to the massive mansion, and Lena is like, jackpot, baby. I mean, they got Fabergé eggs out and everything. I mean, come on. She's taken to a room, which they left just as it was, but realize that she might have grown out of it by now. They actually don't really know what she likes anymore, and Esther bursts that she likes painting. Alan is a bit confused, as she never liked painting before, but he's actually happy, as he is a painter himself. Phew, that was close. The plan is for them to speak to the therapist the next day, bringing up the doctor had a parrot named Sydney, and Lena just nods along. Yep, love that bird. My favorite. In the session, Lena does her best to distract from the topic of what happened to her, and the doctor is accepting that it will take time. She tries to deflect to the bird, pretending that she's happy to see it again, which turns out to be another mistake. Afterwards, Seeger wants to see her mom, and Lena wants to know what they're saying. She pretends to accidentally spill a drink on the receptionist, and she runs off to clean it up. She flips on a speaker, hearing the doctor doctor asking if she's the same as before. Trisha says that of course she's different, even the accent thing is pretty strange. The doctor tells her that it's not necessarily unusual, as she was there for quite a while, and her speech patterns are still developing. Though there are some concerns, for example she got the wrong bird name, and the whole moment to her felt more like a performance than real. Red alert! Lena springs into distraction mode and begins to shriek loudly. The others run out, and she blames another kid for punching her and tearing her dress. It does work to her benefit, as she she's whisked away, and looks quite pleased with her work. Although there is someone else that appears suspicious of her after popping up all this time, as she sees the detective nearby snapping some photos. Well, that guy's definitely gonna be a problem. Back at home, Lena has the opportunity to meet Gunner's absolute douchebag friends. One guy makes fun of her outfit, and she insults him back in Estonian. He replies, dumbfounded, is that Spanish or something? Alan cheers her up that they'll get her a new dress, and invites her to check out his art studio. Lena is overwhelmed by just how magnificent it is in here, which is another moment of confusion for Alan. She's acting like she's never been in here before. Well, eh. There's another of these slip-ups when she asks about all the lights in the room. That's his whole thing, it turns out, and he clicks on black lights, revealing a hidden layer to his paintings. We remember in the first film that Lena used this same style to disturbing effect, and this must be where the inspiration came from. She sees another piece covered up and pulls back the sheet, seeing that it's a bunch of clippings and items related to her going missing, including something regarding the detective. He quickly covers it up, saying, there's no need to dwell on the past. He's ready for them to sit down and do some painting, and she curiously wants to paint him. He does a few joking poses at first, but she wants to see that same emotional side of him that the missing board brought out. He glumly says that he doesn't want to go there, and hey, it looks like it worked like a charm. Trisha is elsewhere on the phone, strong-arming a friend of hers into attending an upcoming charity function, and sneaks a peek of the girl with Alan. She shows off the sketch, and he beams that he loves it. It's incredible. He leaves her a second to get some paint, and left alone, Lena takes some charcoal from the drawing and places it on her lips, imitating kissing. Trisha sees the whole thing looking weirded out. About to unwrap her bandages in the bathroom, Trisha sneaks in and goes right for her Bible. She tells her to stay away, it's private, and Trisha mumbles something about looking for a watch and apologizes for the intrusion. Seeking a safer place to store it, she discovers the real Esther's journal in a nook in the dollhouse, and she uses the words written in it to start imitating her faux self more accurately. At dinner, Alan gives high praise to Esther's abilities. She has more talent than he did in his 20s. Gunner doesn't get how that's even possible. She was drawing stick figures four years ago. Showing her research is paying off, she thanks Trisha by calling her mummy, just as Esther did, and hearing this causes her to get instantly emotional. Detective Donnan pays a visit under the guise of welcoming Esther home. Yet, there is a troubling lack of knowledge regarding her story. They need to know if there's still any chance of danger. That's why they've set up a group session with the family, as well as Seeger all set up for tomorrow. Wanting to delay this as long as possible, Lena pops up to bring up that Trisha's big event is the same day. This does buy her one more day, but the bell will soon toll. She's gonna have to come up with a good story and quick. Thusly, she decides it's time to take her leave and stops when noticing a mouse poking out of the vents. She tells it, sorry that you live here, and then runs off into the night. Out front, she notices the lights flicking back and forth in Alan's studio, meaning that he's painting again. This causes Lena to reconsider her next move, and she decides to head back after all. The next night, it's her big charity event, but Trisha is 
is distracted. She brings up some lingering concerns regarding Esther, in particular that she seems to lie about some things. Alan calls this notion insane and shoots back maybe she needs to see a therapist. He steps out and to her surprise is all dressed up, saying that he is going to join her at the event. She's dumbfounded but happy, noting that since we got Esther back, it feels like we got us back too. This certainly appears to be the case as the couple starts getting frisky. And from the door crack, Lena looks on with a mix of horror and betrayal, reminding us of the infamous kitchen lovemaking scene that she witnessed in the original. She angrily tears Trisha's dress and runs away. She then sees the damage herself, moaning about how much it costs, and he jokes he can fix it with some safety pins. Oh boy, my poor designer dress, woe is me. Dan trusts Gunner to look after his sister, and he tells him confidently he's got this. Lena sees her parents off, telling Mummy that she looks nice. Once they leave, she turns to Gunner. What are we gonna do now? And he laughs back, we? He's got bigger plans going on, inviting all of his brain dead friends over for some drinking. The topic turns to his sister. Does she seem different now? He scoffs that she's different, all right. She has an accent and dresses like Lizzie Borden. Esther pops in asking who that is, and another kid fills her in. A crazy kid who killed her parents with an ax. Gunner shoes her away to go watch a movie or something, and she is not having it, retorting for him to go fuck himself. The sibling rivalry has to be put on hold when Donnan makes another unexpected visit. Gunner explains that his parents are at the gala, which the detective is 100% aware of. He starts to potentially blackmail him for having a party, but they decide to just forget the whole thing ever happened. He just needs to use the restroom real quick before leaving, and I'm sure he's not intending on doing any snooping whatsoever. No way. He immediately descends upon Lena's room in search of clues and finds some juicy fingerprints on the record thanks to his blacklight. He quickly bags it and saunters away, but Lena notices him from afar. She runs back and collects her Bible, then noticing the missing record, she slams it closed in frustration. Lena has left the shower running to hopefully cover her tracks, while Donnan gets back to his car. After their function, the parents are on the way home, and Alan, loosened up with some alcohol, jokes that he just hopes the house is still standing. When he was 16, he nearly burned the house down. Always protective Trisha says Gunner would never do that, and he considers maybe he wasn't talking about him, meaning Lena, of course. Well, we know where things go. When they arrive home, Trisha sees another opportunity and goes right for her Bible. Amongst the pages, she finds pictures of the family, including ones with her face marked out, and then a clipping of the detective along with his address. She flips all the way to the end and spots a Sarn Institute logo emblazoned in the cover. Well, looks like the cat's out of the bag. Only now does she go to the shower and pulls back the curtain, seeing that Lena isn't there, and the whole crazy development overwhelms her. What to do now? Donnan pours himself a drink and gets down to some good old-fashioned fingerprint dusting. He compares the one from the record to an older one from the real Lena, and surprise, surprise, they are not a match. He hears the door closing behind him, and he goes to check it out, noticing a knife missing in the kitchen. He grabs a gun and looks to an old missing poster. If she's not Esther, then who the hell is she? That will remain a mystery to him, as Lena appears and repeatedly stabs him in the back. She asks how he was able to figure things out. Her own mother doesn't even know. Shockingly, that isn't the case, seeing Trisha is here and holding in a gun. She unloads into the cop, and mutters, damn it. Lena tries to play innocent, calling her mummy again, but the jig is up. Trisha gets right down to brass tacks. So you're actually a grown ass woman and a wanted criminal, calling it beyond fucked up. But she shrugs that all she ever does is clean up after her kids anymore. She knew that when she learned Donan had come back to the house that she would find her here. She is curious though, why did she just not rob them blind and leave? She then figured out that she must have bigger plans at play to manipulate them all for a while, and then they all die in some mysterious tragic accident. Lena pleads to let her go. She'll never see her again. Things aren't so simple, you see, as Esther can't disappear twice, you know. Lena now understands that Esther didn't simply disappear, she was killed. And as Trisha reveals, was done in by none other than her brother. Twist her own she does admit that Gunner was always too rough with her, and one night it went too far. Yet still dismisses the whole thing. Was she just supposed to lose her only child over some silly sibling matter? Pretty cold there, lady. She says that she did love Esther with all her heart, but will protect her family no matter what. On that note, she refuses to let some psycho dwarf destroy what she built, and puffs that people like her matter in this country. There's an extra wrinkle of complication to their situation. When Alan got the word that she was alive, happiness crossed his face for the first time in a while. Esther's disappearance changed him and who he was supposed to be, and says that they're going to have to work together for his benefit. They carry the detective's body through the woods and toss it down a well. Lena asks if Esther is down there, and Trisha gets gruff, telling her to never say her name. She thinks they can't 
can make this a mutually beneficial arrangement, considering you chose this role. Now it's time for you to really play it. It's not like she has too many options anyway. Pretend to be Esther or take the fall for the detective's death and go back to Estonia in handcuffs. Well, when you put it that way, the girls come home after their bonding trip and already are working in tandem, blaming her injury on falling off her bike. Trisha does tell Gunnar the truth and he's beside himself. There's a psycho living in her house and we just have to live with her? She clarifies that she doesn't mean that. They just have to play along for now and then later can set up some kind of fake accident to take her out. Gunnar moaning, this is insane even for them. Of course, they weren't meeting in complete privacy, seeing Esther as always is looking down from the window. They dive into the new team up headfirst as they've got to figure out how to clean up that whole bird mix up. Lena knows they just have to work harder to make the doctor believe together. Their plan goes off swimmingly during the session with Siegel. They're asked to recall a shared family memory and she poses it to Alan. He rattles off trips like Christmas in Paris and summer in Tuscany or Yellowstone, Trisha chimes in. It's an obvious setup for Lena to then play her part, remembering a chipmunk stealing her sandwich and her dear old dad falling off a horse. Well, that sounds like one silly ass trip. A chipmunk stole her sandwich. Wow, I honestly just wish that would happen to me just once. Thanks to their stellar performance, Siegel determines they are all good. The family unit is back together and Esther is totally fine and highly functional. For Trisha, the mimicry still isn't on point enough and she tells her to stop with all the glowering. Esther is a lady after all. Knowing that she's in desperate need of a makeover, they buy her a whole bunch of new designer stuff to change up her style. Tricky Trisha also knows that everyone expects her to be broken after what happened, but what they really want to see is a happy ending. So that's what they're gonna give them. She knows that she can paint and ask what else she can do, and of course she can sure tinkle the ivories. So they show off her skills at the party to an astonished crowd. They then make the rounds all smiles and happy to be back. Someone asks about her plans now, and Trisha steps in absolutely nothing. She's never letting her out of her sight again. Everyone awes in unison at the seemingly sweet display, the poor rubes. After the gathering, she's confronted by her Fobro, trying to comprehend the bizarre situation. She orders him to get out of her room, and he reminds her this is his dead sister's room, it will never be hers. She again tells him to fuck off, and he gets agitated, saying that she doesn't belong here, this is his family and his house. He gets right in her face, growling that he owns her. And she doesn't appreciate this, smacking him across the face. He threatens if she does that again, he'll kill her like he killed Esther. She does so without hesitation, and Gunner is flustered. He warns that with one call, he could end her completely. It's not like anyone would believe her word over his anyway. People like him matter. The brief mentions of class dynamic stuff is maybe a little unnecessary, but I do get what they're going for here. This family, at least Gunner and Trisha, are entitled assholes. This is all enough for Trisha to try and end things by poisoning Lena's food under the guise of making her her favorite meal. Alan, clueless as always, rattles on about feeling more inspired than ever. And it's all thanks to Esther's return. He feels like a kid again. She wants to join him on a big upcoming meeting in the city, but Trisha shuts this down, saying that they have other plans. Lena wants to know what plans exactly, and Trisha will only tell her it's a surprise. She has to be excused, and with her mother's insistence, takes her special food along. As a kind of test, she sets it out for her mouse buddy, wanting to see if it was indeed poisoned as suspected. She takes out a photo of the parents and rips out Trisha, just as Alan comes by to check on her. She excuses that she just doesn't like mom's cooking much, and he chuckles he's not a big fan either. He is still happy to connect with her further, and asks her to join him for some nighttime painting to Lena's delight. They share a tender moment, painting together, and Trisha watches on in disapproval as usual. She takes his paint-covered hand and gives it a little innocent kiss. He's done for the night, leaving her to turn off the lights after he leaves. The black lights take over, and she decides to add her own hidden layer to her portrait of Alan, a long, streaming tear rolling down his face. The hidden pain he feels for losing Esther. Then Trisha enters, disgusted at what she's seen. She does at least agree that she's talented, but balks at her thinking he would ever want you, especially after revealing who she really is. Surprise, I'm not your daughter, I'm a maniacal killer. Yeah, he's probably gonna be repulsed as she assumes most men are by her. She takes her leave to go fuck her husband, thanking her that he really is a new man since she came back. Gross. The back and forth is taken to even higher levels when Lena is awoken to a plate clattering and finds her furry friend dead, now knowing that she was trying to kill her. They still maintain the facade and it's time for Alan's big meeting. Trisha gushes that she loves that they have painting in common, but is hoping to find something they can share. That's why she shouldn't come with him. Besides, he should focus on his work. This could get him back out there and on top. They come downstairs to a heavenly smell and see Lena hard at work creating the family a breakfast feast. Trisha wants to make her own 
problem. But Lena already has a delicious smoothie waiting for her. She then excuses that she's not really that hungry, but Alan eggs her on to give it a try. She made it just for you. She takes one sip and retches before dumping it down the sink, noticing it had the mouse's carcass in there. Trisha tries to play it cool and turns on the disposal to dispense of the rodent. At the train station, Alan shows off that he's brought her portrait of him. He wants to know if it's okay to show it to a friend of his that runs the best art school around, as she really is that good. And of course, Lena is delighted at the prospect. He goes off to fetch some coffees and she notices the rest of the family on another platform, the sight of which causes her concern. She takes a chance to dispense of her adversaries, sneaking around the station to get to them and rushes right at them with a drawings case. Unfortunately for her, she bumps right into a guy, foiling her plan. Now all back together, she pleads one last time to join her father, but no such luck. She's stuck with the weirdos. Trisha is especially pissed after the botched assassination attempt, declaring their agreement over. She's dead. Lena attempts to run away, and they wrestle for the purse. She gets out some pepper spray, spraying it right into Gunner's eyes. He cries like a weenie for his mommy, and they continue the chase. Lena makes it to the car, and Trisha pleads for her to open the door. Lena doesn't consider it, flipping her off, and squeals away. She cranks the radio, looking quite pleased with herself, and puts on some lipstick and sunglasses. It's all going her way, that is, until police sirens start wailing behind her. The lady cop, of course, doesn't know exactly what's going on here, but does at least recognize her as Esther. So she calls her mom and, to her worry, also calls Alan to let them know that she's safe. She tries to play happy family in front of the officer and then bemoans of her daughter's recent erratic behavior, as well as the lies and outbursts of anger. Then she continues, realizing she's covering her own tracks for the future, mentions that Esther jokes of taking her own life, but isn't so sure that she's joking. So now if she turns up dead, it's like, see, I told you, officer, lady, I didn't do nothing. She enters the house, determined to end this now, Gunner agreeing that it's about damn time. They burst into a room, telling Lena they're done. Nothing is worth having her in this house. She tries to run, and Gunner catches her, and Mom grabs a pair of scissors. Trisha knows that her death will break her daddy's heart, but shrugs, he'll get over it. Just about to pierce the skin, Lena spits in her face, and the distraction allows her to break free from his grasp. He chases her down the hall and grabs her again at the top of the stairs. He yells for her to die already, and sends her into the air, plummeting to the floor below. His mom enters and he innocently cries. He didn't mean to. It just happened. That's brilliant, she groans. Like, way to go. You killed your sister again, you moron. Things only get more complicated when Alan calls and she tries to still play it cool, telling him everything is fine. He's already foregone his meeting and is on his way back home, even though she tries to take the blame for what happened. It's no big deal. They peer down the stairs and Lena is missing. Trisha growls for him to go down and finish this once and for all. Their time to cover things up growing short. Gunner does, as asked, retreat his fencing foil and setting out after Lena. There's a noise behind him, and he smirks, there you are, with his weapon at the ready. The door creaks open, and he calls for her to come out. But she surprises him from behind, and he attempts to negotiate. Things don't have to be like this. We could work something out. She's highly dubious, asking him, really? And he chuckles, honestly, nah, me neither, she replies, and pulls up a crossbow. She fires, nailing him right in the chest. She then snatches his blade and stabs him in a bloody fury. His mom enters and is horrified at the sight of her dead boy. Lena tries to run and they throw down hard in the kitchen. In the melee, a burner gets turned on and they wrestle for a knife. Trisha straight tosses her opponent over the island, yet when rounding the side, Lena is gone. Man, she is a slippery one. She runs upstairs and the flames start to build into a full-on fire. Might want to do something about that. It seems it is already too late as it starts to quickly spread and shatters the windows. Trisha finds Lena in her room and grumbles that she took everything from her. When it comes to Alan, she states he will never be hers, but he will know what she truly is. A deformed freak who manipulated their grief, murdered their son, and tried to kill her. Until Trisha did what had to be done. Lena hops out the window, making her way up to the roof, with Trisha not far behind. Alan then makes it home to the place totally engulfed in flames. The girls are still fighting on the roof, and both lose their grip, sliding down the side, and end up hanging onto the edge for dear life. Alan arrives, and both argue that the other one is the bad one, but before he can even choose, Trisha loses her grip and falls to the ground, getting brained on impact. He does manage to save Lena, and both clutch each other close, looking over the side. Things go awry, though, when he reaches out her face and accidentally knocks out her false teeth, exposing the real monster within. Lena defends that she did this for him, for us. I love you. Just as Trisha suspected, he screams that she's a monster and kind of trips, really, right over the side of the house, landing right next to Trisha. She looks down coldly at their mutilated corpses, hearing the fire brigade on the way. Even with the house completely engulfed in flames, Lena calmly returns to her room to clean up and takes off Trisha's dress, replacing it with her signature black one. She walks down the stairs with a stoic smile on her face, the flames climbing the walls all around her. She strolls right outside, and then we pick up sometime after.
doctor, with Seeger and another lady discussing the tragedy of her situation. As for where she'll end up next, Seeger brings up a high quality adoption agency that she knows of, and she's confident that Esther will get the love and support that she deserves. After all, who wouldn't want to adopt her? And Lena gives a gentle smile along with a tear rolling down her face. Well, we know where things go next. With that, we've reached the conclusion of this ending explained for Orphan vs. Kill. But don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Thonflix. What did you think of Orphan vs. Kill and its ending? Do you want to see more adventures with Lena? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Thonflix. See you next time.